I come because I like to learn about what is going on in the industry. Um, I like to hear from the contractors, especially because you know, being an engineer, sometimes you need you you know, it's good to learn from the contractors what innovations they're coming up with, and obviously to meet with other folks and see what you know they're working on. This conference, it's one probably the most important event during the calendar year, so you cannot miss it because here you can meet a lot of people, uh, contractor, um, supplier, competitors. Uh, so, as I said, it's the most important event in the calendar for foundation business and uh, uh, it's, it's too important to don't be here, let's say. We come because we get a lot of exposure to people who use our equipment. We Camaraderie, a lot of camaraderie. You know, even with our competitors, we come out and we rub shoulders. Everybody knows everybody. It's just one big happy family. Well, it depends on whether or not you want to continue learning. If you've got a desire to continue to learn, then you need to be at DFI. The good thing about this conference, you can meet a lot of people over and over. So you can make a very good connection with the uh, industrial people. Networking is huge. There's so many people here just from different parts of the country and the state and the world even. And just seeing what processes they're using and their design methods and their equipment and just really a lot of exposure and also getting connected with those people um, for potentially future work, future jobs. Come join us. If you're, if you're uh, interested in anything in this industry, this is the place to be. This is, this is it. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Depending upon whichever the part of the world you are, welcome to the DFI India Groundwork 2022 Webinar 4. Recording of this webinar is prohibited. Online webinar recordings will be available on DFI of India YouTube channel in approximately two weeks. You can enter your questions anytime during the presentation in the Ask your question tab, which is beside the live stream box. And now I introduce our session moderator, Mr. PVSR Prasad, Geotechnical Manager, Keller Ground Engineering India. Mr. Prasad has graduated with the Master of Technology in Geotechnical Engineering from IIT Delhi. He has been working with Keller since 2016 and he's presently a geotechnical manager for Keller India South. His professional interests include heavy foundations, especially broadcast in stew piles, deep excavations, ground improvement works in soft soils, soil retention systems, using deep soil mixing, jet grouting and various grouting works in soil and rock. We welcome you Prasad sir, over to you. Thank you Mr. Shrita. Uh, for good welcoming speech and uh, would like to uh, welcome all the participants uh, for this Groundwork Webinar 4 today. And uh, today we have received a registration from almost 24 countries, which is a very big platform uh, to have this webinar today. And that's why we would like to welcome all and we have a great opportunity to have this webinar as well. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, yeah. So this webinar actually for uh, it uh, comes with uh, like introduction, like uh, we will introduce the session moderator that's already done by Mr. Shrita and presentation by Mr. Franz Werner Garrison on diaphragm wall installation using trench cutter and followed by Q&A session and closing remarks and followed by uh, details of up upcoming programming. And if you see here the presentation on diaphragm wall installation using trench cutter, and uh, you all know actually the diaphragm walls are very famous in detention systems and also deep cutoff walls or any many applications in metro projects. But however, in India, as of now, is a quite famous is for uh, doing grabbing. It, it can be a violent grab or it can be a cable uh, mounted uh, grabs in the soil, but where the trench cutter is mainly required in the hard rock where you want to install the diaphragm wall and very limited contractors or very limited specialized people are doing this particular uh, work. So we got one of the uh, specialized uh, uh, experts from 
Bauer, actually Mr. Franz Werner uh, Garrison. He will he will be introducing us on different uh, mechanics of the diaphragm wall using trench cutter. So I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Franz. Uh, he is a director of method development department and Bauer Machine and Scrum uh, GmbH Germany. And Mr. Franz is the director of the method development department at Bauer, and he has studied at the RWTH Aachen, Germany, and graduated as a civil engineer since 1992 after joining Bauer Spezi uh, Altrubau Ground uh, GmbH, a sister company of Ground Bauer Machinen. He was responsible for some departments like the Department of Construction of Diaphragm Wall and Cutoff Walls, as well as for Ground Improvement Department. Since 2004, he builds up the Department of Method of Develop Method Development for Bauer Machinen Ground uh, GmbH with a focus on developing new methods like uh, cutter soil, cutter soil mixing. Just a minute. Yeah, cutter soil mixing or improving methods like full displacement piles. In addition to the development of he was uh, development, he was involved in the promotion and introduction of new technologies as an author and speaker of over 70 technical publications in countries all over the world. At DFI, he is a member of the soil mixing committee, board member of DFI Europe, and member of the board of uh, trustees. I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Franz to continue his presentation on diaphragm wall installation using trench cutter. Welcome you, uh, Franz, and is all uh, the stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Share my screen. You can share your screen now. So, hopefully, everybody can yeah. see my screen. Yeah, we are, we are, we can able to see. Thanks for the nice introduction and you already made some good words on uh, let's say the use of cutter uh, around the world or maybe also for the future in India. And this is why this presentation is uh, focused on the direct wall installation using trench cutters. So looking to the agenda of today's presentation, uh, I will give you a little bit of general outlook uh, about let's say what we think about uh, definition and applications for the diaphragm wall use of the trench cutter. We have a quick look to the procedure. Uh, as I heard, there are a couple of students joining, so we need to get into the basics as well. So we are talking about stabilizing, stabilizing fluids, uh, concrete and reinforcement. And obviously, we need to talk about uh, equipment, a bit about accuracy, and finally, we will have a look at some uh, nice references where the equipment system was in use or is. So first of all, I said definition application. First, what is a diaphragm wall? So everybody knows piles, round-shaped elements. Here now we are talking about a series of rectangular panels producing mainly a continuous wall. And uh, as a specific feature, we don't have the type of the casing as we are used to have it uh, most likely for piles. Now here during exploration, it's a kind of an open trench, and this needs to be supported by a stabilizing fluid to avoid collapses. So what are some characteristics of this method and product? Um, so first of all, it's uh, working under very restricted site conditions, so you are quite flexible. Uh, anyway, you can go for great depths, which is also not common. And uh, due to the equipment and the tools, you can almost work in any kind of soil conditions, even hard soils and rock conditions. The product which we will finally achieve uh, can be characterized as a watertight, low deformation or flexible, and permanent or temporary. So they are quite flexible in the use of the diaphragm or application. So looking to the main applications, I would say, uh, first of all, in the picture on the left at the top. Uh, cutter walls, cutter walls for seal purposes, uh, dam recoveries, containment of contaminations, uh, mainly in the combination of inserting shield pipes uh, and build it then as a retaining wall is quite common um, application. I think one of the most common application obviously is a retaining wall, so mainly uh, executed as a reinforced concrete wall 
So whenever you will have to go for an excavation pit, uh, either you have a metro station or any kind of building excavation pit, you require a reinforced concrete wall as a retreat. Quite rarely, but still an option. And then, of course, not as a wall, you can use it as a foundation element, uh, load bearing elements, uh, with the advantage of these barriers that you can orientate these barriers in a way that you can fully use, make use of the capability in terms of uh, stability. And as a very specific uh, feature of, I would say, retaining walls, a lot of shafts uh, have been built so far. And they are mainly, yes, again, reinforced concrete walls, like the retaining walls, as they most likely have this retaining purpose, but they have a special shape. Looking to the procedure, and here we are really looking to the procedure of doing a diaphragm wall by a trench cutter. So first of all, we have to do a small kind of pre-excavation to allow the cutter to be lowered down into the trench. The cutter is equipped with a slurry pump, and this slurry pump has to suck all the material which is loosened by the cutter and will transport it to a descending unit. So therefore, this pump needs to be lowered down into a slurry, otherwise, this pump will not work. So in principle, it acts like a kind of a hoover cleaner, so it needs some sucking energy. Therefore, we need this small pre excavation. But as soon as you did this pre excavation, you start cutting a trench, and most likely, trenches are done with one and two full bites, and uh, approximately half of the size of the cutter center bites, so two and a half bites, creating big size of primary panels. So after the excavation is done, the slurry will be cleaned prior to the insertion of the reinforcement cage. The reinforcement cage will be lowered down and afterwards the concreting will take place. After we installed a series of primary panels, and you can see there is always a gap in between, we come back and cut in between these primary panels, a so-called secondary panel. The secondary panel is then overcutting the existing concrete of the primary panels and creates a kind of an interlocking system between primary and secondary panels for a good ceiling purpose. After this cut has been done, again, slurry will be cleaned, reinforcement will be installed, and concrete will take place. And so by the end of the day, we will form continuous concrete. So this is the general process. Of course, there might be some changes for specific uh, applications, but in principle, this can be seen as a general process of the installation of using a diaphragm wall by a trench. Now looking to the materials, as we already talked about the slurry, uh, which we need to stabilize the uh, trench and we need the concrete uh, reinforcement. Let's have a look at the tools we usually need. So first of all, the support fluid. The support fluid has several functions. The main function, of course, is to keep the trench open and to prevent the collapse. So it's stabilizing uh, this trench uh, to allow a safe uh, excavation process. In this application of using the trench cutter, this slurry acts also as a transport medium for the loosened material. So as said, when the cutter wheels are going down, you turn the cutter wheels in a way that the material will be loosened, and then this pump sucks as well the loosened soil and the slurry as as said, as a mover cleaner, and pumps it away from the trench. So that means we need a slurry as a transport medium. And in addition, as all the uh, equipment is uh, lowered down in the trench, it reduces also the wear, um, as we have, let's say, a kind of easing system using this slurry. Obviously, with the slurry goes along uh, very intensive um, quality assurance, and especially when we look for this slurry based on bentonite liquid, 
Uh, we have to have a look at, let's say, the slurry during the whole process in order to create a good quality wall and have a continuous working process. And here we can see some of the typical equipments uh, we should have on a job site to do this mud control. So we use it for the density, uh, for the viscosity, uh, for the stability using this filter press, sand content, and also the shear strength system called all other method. Obviously, we need to follow some rules for these um, slurry values. And uh, the, here are, is a table taken out of one of the European standards. Uh, there are other standards as well available. And there are typical properties which should be controlled and should be looked at during the process. And there are some, let's say, values for fresh and reuse of this. Um, and slurries, but I think the most important thing is what do we have to have in the trench prior to concreting, especially with a focus on the sand content, uh, to avoid that we have sand inclusions in our concrete after the concreting, which would lead to a bad quality of concrete and maybe some images. So slurry control is quite of importance and should be done. As another alternative to the bentonite, there are also polymer slurries available. It depends a little bit on the region of the world uh, where more bentonite or more polymer slurries are in use. For the polymers, uh, there are several types of uh, different polymers available. A big um, difference compared to the bentonite is that we usually don't get uh, any internal shear strengths which in some cases makes it a little bit more complicated for stability. So in my opinion, polymers are mainly suitable as pure polymer in cohesive soils. As soon as we have granular soils in the ground, we might act with a hybrid slurry or To get a little bit more deeper into this and not doing a big lecture now during these presentations, there is a support fluid guide for the foundations developed in a joint effort by the DFI and the EFFC. So it's a quite uh, nice, let's say, guidebook. And this you can download for free either on the DFI or on the EFFC webpage. So this is some more details on uh, all the information you require for the slurry support, either design consideration, the properties, the materials, execution, the trials, and also accepting values. So this is something which is always under review and under constant update process, but we sure sooner or later we will get uh, an updated version. But uh, nevertheless, to start with, it's quite good uh, to have when working with uh, support fluids. So after we have a nice and clean um, panel and we meet the requirements for the concreting, now we have to focus on concrete and reinforcement. And uh, obviously the concrete is a little bit of special concrete. So the choice of suitable concrete is uh, quite important. Uh, it needs to be very stable against segregation and it has to be uh, inserted into the trench using a tremi pipe system. And also the tremi pipe system is quite of importance because you need to avoid that uh, the concrete will separate and will uh, remain only in its aggregate pieces like the gravel or the sand or the concrete itself. So that means when looking to the concrete process, so before placement, obviously you have to put the tremi pipe into the slurry, and then you have to have a kind of separation medium to allow pushing this, let's say, usually it's a kind of a plastic ball, for instance, uh, to push the slurry through this training pipe by the concrete, that the concrete is not in free form in the slurry. 
So, and then we start with the code process. And of course, let's say the removal of family types uh, has to be done piece by piece to maintain the complete flow. Also here for the Tremi concrete, um, there are a lot of recommendations. What are the target values in terms of flow and velocity um, in segregation? So there are a lot of details and for sure you don't need to remember all these numbers right now and after the presentation, because here we have again the chance to look at one of these concrete plants. Besides uh, the concrete itself, uh, also reinforcement is important. On the right hand side, we need to have, let's say, a cover to avoid that uh, the reinforcement will erode. But we also need the sufficient spacing in between the bars to allow the concrete to flow through these uh, bars into this area to the wall surface to have a sufficient concrete cover. So this is quite important uh, when considering the design of reinforcement cages. When we look to some of these recommended values, so the concrete cover should have at least a minimum of 75 millimeters in the wall, between the wall and the first uh, horizontal the bar. And a very important uh, value is uh, the so-called overcut value. As you remember, with the primary panels uh, where we install the reinforcement cages, later on we come back uh, with a secondary panel. And with a secondary panel, we overcut into the primary uh, panels. And of course, in this overcut area, there should be no reinforcement because uh, cutting concrete is okay, but cutting the reinforcement cages is not that much. This should be anyway. Also, here we have uh, a guide to Tremi concrete for the foundations. Here we have already, let's say, a second version. And again, this is a joint effort between the BFI and the C. And also, this uh, guide is easy to download for free, so it's just additional information. And there are all parties involved uh, from the academics, uh, the suppliers, the uh, construction companies. So real, really here is the full knowledge which we have in the industry uh, fit in these two guides for the planning concrete and the support scenario. And I think this is a very good uh, input to the industry and that's why it is for free for each and everybody because we all want to avoid uh, any kind of damages and errors on all the job sites. Now let's have a look to the equipment. And uh, as we are talking about the cutter, of course, we need to have a look to the cutter equipment. Here we can see, let's say, various types. First of all, the cutter itself um, has a length of 2.8 to 3.2 meters and the width for the wall uh, in a range of 640 to 2000 millimeters. This cutter frame uh, equipped with the wheels is usually equipped either on standard crane, a drill rig, uh, which is then, let's say, uh, a little bit uh, adjusted to the use, or a specific carrier, which can also be a crane or some other carriers. What we have to distinguish is the so-called hose handling system. So you see this slurry hose, for instance. This slurry hose is uh, necessary to pump the slurry. It's a estimated material from the trench via this hose to a descending unit. So, and you can imagine with these handling systems here, this we call a hose tensioning system. This we call hose synchronization systems. You can imagine the achievable depth is somehow twice the mast or the mast leg. So to go deeper, you need a different solution. And therefore, we have this so-called host drum system. And so all these hoses can be uh, 
put on this drum, and depending on the size of the drum, you can achieve much bigger depths using this constraint systems. The actual maximum possible depth with the host drum system achieved is 250 meters. You can imagine this is quite possible with such kind of system shown on the left. Now, as I said at the very beginning, this uh, cutter system is almost suitable for all kinds of soil conditions or rock conditions. And here you can see why this is, as I told you. We have different types of uh, wheel systems. So we have a standard wheel equipped with standard T's, which is typically used for all kinds of soil uh, conditions and lower strength rock. As soon as we get into, let's say, harder strength rock, we usually switch to the round chain chisel wheels. Here is one of uh, example round chain chisel, uh, which can then be um, put onto these wheels and can cut into rock. And when looking to a very hard rock, we have also the option to go for the roller bit uh, wheels. But uh, most frequently here in rock, these round chain chisel wheels are used uh, if you are in normal soil conditions. There are different teas available, as I said, depending on the local conditions, um, and how these opportunities to adjust it to these local conditions. But the cutter is not the only part of uh, a system for the cutter job site. I mentioned a few times already that uh, the excavated material will be pumped to a descending unit. Uh, on the other hand, of course, if you suck out all the slurry, you need fresh slurry into the trench to keep it stable. So there is another bentonite pump pumping the material to the trench, which is somehow, let's say, uh, supported um, by a mixing plant and so on. But to keep the slurry into the circuit, so we pump slurry to the trench, we suck the slurry, including the material out of the trench via the hoses, it will be pumped to a central descending unit. And this descending unit is just, let's say, the most common name. In principle, we have to say it's not only a descending unit, it's really a slurry handling plant. So this really can um, consist of desilters, decanters, uh, sieves, and we will have a look to it in a little bit more in detail. So whenever it uh, comes to this um, central, let's say, slurry cleaning unit, let's say, uh, first of all, it will pass as a pre-screening unit where all the coarse material uh, will be separated and the remaining material uh, will, let's say, drop down in an outflow. And from there, it will be transported to a second stage. Uh, and in this second stage, we have very much opinions or options. We can here as well have, let's say, two several stages uh, with various sizes of cyclins. Um, with these various sizes of cyclins, we can define so-called cut point, which is a, a point describing the option to clean the material of this uh, soil out of this slurry. And depending on um, the size of these cyclones, we talk about uh, a descender or a desilter, um, which we have in several stages. At the final stage, uh, or let's say after the cleaning process, the clean slurry is then brought back to the slurry circuit and pumped back to the trench. As a final stage, there is an option even to have really clean water. So whatever comes from this um, first stage of cleaning, descending, desilting, and by the end of the day, I may need to separate, even, let's say, all the solids from the water. Um, here is the option to go for a decanter and for cleaning purposes, you, you have to add some flocculants uh, to get really separation of all the solids and water. Sometimes this decanter is just an additional, let's say, add-on uh, 
for the reduction of density, but in the final stage, you can use it also for the full free. So, in principle, um, everything is possible in this slide. And as I said, it's important that uh, not only we have to look to the cutter, we have also to have a careful look to the auxiliary equipment to make the system a real success. Moving a little bit into QA, QC, and uh, I just want to go into two things. Uh, the one is our internal electronic system, and the second uh, is some, let's say, independent things. And um, on the one hand side, we have this internal system on our base carriers, uh, which we call electronic. And there we have all, let's say, an internal data recording and visualization. So the operator has all the information during the process of uh, what he needs to run the system. Of course, all the machine data are recorded as well. Um, so we have this recording during the complete excavation process. On the other hand side, uh, when we're looking to independent, um, let's say, quality control, we typically talk about uh, coding measurement, especially uh, to control the final trench and see uh, and control the verticality and the volume of the trench. A little bit more about our Vitronic. Um, looking to our Vitronic, as said, this is a live monitoring and measuring system and visualization. So the operator has all these screens here. We have the cutter screen. Here we left it in just for information, also for the web. So the operator gets all the required information he needs to run the system, uh, especially, let's say, for deviation control, so that he can everything adjust via this touch screen. In addition, all these data, let's say, are not only shown to the operator, we have also a data transfer, let's say, for instance, to the office uh, that you can use the recorded data to do your documentation. And in principle, even sitting in the office, uh, you can have, let's say, a live view to the operator's monitor and uh, get the same screen as uh, he has on site. So far, a little bit about all these, let's say, series and uh, equipment and slurries and so on. And finally, I think we need to look to some of the job sites to get a little bit an idea of what is possible um, using the trench cutting technique. First of all, uh, I'd like to start in, in Paris, here in France, just in the neighborhood of uh, Germany, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Grand Metro Paris job site, and you see a couple of uh, customers working there. Looking to the Grand Prix, uh, Metro Paris. This is actually the largest infrastructure project in Europe um, with a fundamental redesign of the public transport network. And it's really, let's say, a huge impact uh, to Paris. And you can see, let's say, the execution started back uh, in 2016 and is planned somehow to 2030 with a lot of um, job sites to be done. Let me go a little bit more into the details. So there is a plan to add four additional lines with a total of about 200 kilometers of new railway lines uh, with 68 uh, new stations. So they expect 2 million passengers every day. And um, yeah, 90% of these lines are built underground. And can you imagine what this means if you work uh, a lot of uh, underground? You have also to build the stations, and here we have a view of one very typical station um, for an underground metro station on a length of 225 meters. Obviously, the aim is uh, to connect the metro lines with the local intercity transport system. And uh, it's always nice to have enough space. Here you can see a typical uh, MC crane with a cutter, a mount on it, um, depth in range of 40 to 57 meters. It's uh, quite okay. Um, 
with a width of 1500 millimeter, and they also use this triple byte primaries in order to reduce the number of joints for their projects. Here, some impressions uh, that it is a relatively small crane, as the depth is not that big, uh, could be done with this MC64. You can see some very special wheels, uh, which were not uh, mentioned before, because this is an ongoing development on um, hybrid wheels to allow working in uh, soft soil and hard soil conditions at the same time. Uh, and this is still an ongoing process. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, the descending unit, and you can see here the various stages. So we have here small desilter units, and here a container where and that's included. But you can see it's not always that uh, easy to work. Uh, we have also a lot of uh, areas in Paris where we have limitations in the work area. Either we are working in an area where we have only 20 meter width and still uh, have to go down for 60 meter in depth. So it isn't special carriers or we have height restrictions uh, of let's say for here at least 6.5 meters, still working in hard soil condition. So there we need also special carriers to allow working under this kind of conditions. Uh, metro stations actually are quite uh, famous to be built um, a little bit closer to uh, on the way to India. Now we uh, pass um, the state of Israel. Here also the metro in Tel Aviv uh, has been built uh, by one of our customers. And the situation here is uh, yeah, a number of different metro stations had to be built. Um, so, and again, it's an extension and um, of existing metro lines, but also adding new ones here, for instance, to Rekha. And uh, this customer had to build finally four stations using this type of all equipment with the use of the host tension system. Again, the depths are not too deep, 38 to 54 meters, uh, but they are facing, let's say, a lot of other problems. Again, with site conditions of inner city job site, you can imagine what does it mean to have the equipment here, and uh, so where to place the descending unit. But this is also one of the benefits of using the diaphragm wall cutter technique. The excavation, as it is done via these uh, hoses and slurry lines, the descending unit can be placed also, let's say, a few hundred meters away, where we may have some space for the cleaning. And not everything needs to be uh, placed at one single spot. Now we go a little bit into a different direction. We go to uh, Brazil, Metro Sao Paulo, another metro station. And um, I choose this project as a reference project because this has a very specific geometry, um, as you can see. And um, here we could see, or our customers could see the benefit of using this um, diaphragm wall technique. In the first stage, there was a different plan to build five full rings, demolish the rings in between, um, doing it with temporary walls. And then they had some contaminations in an area beside that and uh, had to add a cutoff wall. But finally they said, okay, let's do it in one shot and do it as overlapping shafts, using it as a permanent wall uh, where we don't need an additional cutoff wall. So there were a lot of benefits, especially also in terms of times, because time is always an issue when producing such kind of projects as uh, TPMs are approaching from left and right and uh, which excavation needs to be ready. When we look to the excavated shaft here to the station, you see it's only stabilized with struts. There are no anchors at all, which is also a huge benefit because uh, anchoring into and under neighborhood uh, buildings or into neighborhood uh, areas is not very much uh, liked nowadays. So here we have the opportunity to uh, 
uh, work without any kind of um, anchors. Depths in a range of up to 37 meters. Um, here, they only used uh, single byte panels. So even the primaries were single byte. And as a very specific feature, the primaries have been carried out using a grep. So it was a combination of grep and cutter. Uh, the cutter for the secondaries uh, were chosen to do this overcut joint system as a very good ceiling uh, without any additional joint required. Joint systems required. And as a very specific feature, also design uh, wise required, the connection of these panels, of these shafts in this area, has been done by arrow shaped panels. And when we look to these arrow shaped panels, they were excavated uh, in a combination of grab and cutter. And you can see here the very, very specific shaped reinforcement cage. Uh, to stabilize this trench and uh, this concreting was done specifically on a Saturday. Um, as you can imagine, the amount of concrete required for such kind of panel was quite high. And working in Sao Paulo with all the traffic um, to provide a good concrete supply is also very important. And I think this is something which May needs to be considered also uh, when working. So a lot of examples um, for diaphragm walls for excavation pits of metros, but as said, uh, it's not only excavation pit for metros, we have also other opportunities. And here we move to um, a job site um, called Thames Tideway in, uh, in England, in London. And here, uh, the reason to build these, uh, these shafts was that uh, here the, let's say, the sewage system was always, let's say, collapsing with the result that material was, let's say, somehow polluted uh, into the river uh, Thames. And so here was the idea to provide an existing and, and or to improve an existing system and add another system into this sewage system. And uh, it looks like shown on this picture. We have, let's say here, the start position. And the plan was to build a tunnel almost underneath the whole river uh, until it was, let's say, brought to the final um, position. And one of the shafts here had to be built in this area. So you can see here's a main tunnel for the sewage and here's a following the main tunnel. And here's a kind of, let's say, observation part. And um, this shaft has to be built down to a depth of 86 meter. Um, and in this case, again, the decision was taken only to work with single byte primaries and single byte secondaries. As said, for some job sites, we have to adjust the standard procedure. One of the uh, important things here is that we had to cut into the London plain, uh, which is not so easy. And you can see there's almost no material coming out of the center part where usually the coarse material uh, is separated. So mainly we just found fine material uh, to the excavation. But Nevertheless, uh, the excavated shaft uh, looked quite nice. Another project uh, similar uh, to what we saw in, in London uh, is a project in Buenos Aires. And um, here it's again the installation of a new wastewater line within the sewage system, quite a long tunnel. And uh, the aim of the project was to support the reduction of industrial discharges into, let's say, the rivers. And uh, the very specific thing here, when we look to this shaft system, um, sorry, that's a long title, um, we have this connected double shaft with 21 meter in diameter and uh, 60 meter in depth. And again, we have uh, two Y type panels for these connection areas. And the very specific thing on this project 
was that this company Gather is typically um, tunneling company. So they never did a diaphragm wall before on their own. But um, with the support of uh, Bauer machine, um, they were trained in a way that they could finally do these projects on their own and uh, quite successful. Here we can see one of these excellent charts. Uh, it's more now it has uh, a lot of form. So we traveled quite a while around the world, Europe, South America, uh, but we need to go to India. Finally, Chennai Metro. I guess everybody of you know Chennai, and uh, a lot of you know for sure Chennai Metro. And um, actually, the Chennai Metro phase two started with the extension of uh, the corridor three to five. And um, there are a lot of, let's say, new railway lines, um, not too much underground, also a lot of elevated lines, but still there is a lot of, or there is a need of doing a lot of stations. Uh, in a way that we require excavation pits. And uh, looking to the geology of uh, Chennai uh, itself, there are a lot of areas where um, the use of the grab is somehow limited. And that's why I think also a lot of um, stations will be built using um, the cutter system. And uh, we just started bringing a couple of these equipments to various customers. Uh, so this is something which is really ongoing or under preparation process. So whenever you have the chance to go to Chennai, maybe you have the chance also to visit uh, one of these job sites to see one of these cutters in progress. And I said, it's not only for diaphragm walls, for metro stations, we saw some examples also for other sharp applications. And as said at the very beginning, also the use of barrels is an option or cutter walls can be done uh, as well using the cutter system. So far from my side and my colleague who helped me in preparing this presentation, and I'm free now to, ask, uh, to answer your questions. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Franz uh, Werner. Uh, very good presentation which you given. Uh, I would like to ask uh, questions uh, from audience. Any questions? I, I have received some questions here in a chat box. Uh, I will read it for you, uh, Mr. Werner. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first question from Manas. Uh, what is the criteria for arranging the reinforcement side cover in primary panels? so that the, uh, uh, the panels do not get cut for the secondary panels. As I said, uh, in principle, we need to consider that we have this overcut area and this overcut is somehow defined by the, by the depths, typically in a range of 20 to 40 centimeters. These are the most common ranges. And uh, so that means um, we should place the reinforcement cage at least this overcut plus a specific, I would say, 10 centimeter safety um, value from this uh, overcut um, area to avoid that uh, this overcut can take place. Of course, it needs to be, let's say, uh, uh, arranged in a good way. So usually we, we uh, also can, let's say, put some H beams into this area to keep the alignment of the reinforcement cage and to ensure that the reinforcement cages are positioned in the right location. Then remove these H groups after uh, the concrete process. Okay. There are some questions uh, here also from Mr. Manas. Uh, one, uh, another question is that what is the ratio of width of uh, secondary and primary panels? What is the guidance to be used to select the bits? Is there any guidance on the width of panels, or either primary or secondary? Um, let's say for the for the primaries, usually um, 
let's say there are a lot of influencing factors. So we saw some some examples where customers decided to go just for single byte primers. Usually you want to do it, let's say, as big as possible to reduce the number of joints. Uh, but let's say if you have then, let's say, a logistic topic in terms of, let's say, slurry storage or concrete supply, you may consider, let's say, reduction of the size. Um, of course, trench stability is an issue sometimes when the soil conditions does not allow, uh, you have to reduce the size. So there are a couple of influencing factors um, going along with this, uh, this decision why, whether the primaries are, let's say, single byte or multiple byte, and then uh, lengths. Yeah, thanks. Uh, another question which is related to the same width, but this is a width of uh, cutter, actually, is the question from Mr. Manos again. What is the criteria for selection of the width of the cutter? Is it related to the properties of soil or rocket site? Um, when, when you mean the length of the cutter or the size of oh, the cutter? I, I think the size of the, size of the cutter. Uh, he's asking regarding the width of the cutter. The width, so the wall thickness. Yeah, I think so, wall thickness, yeah. Okay, okay. wall thickness uh, in principle, it's a uh, matter of, let's say, design issues. Um, especially for, for stability. And of course, uh, let's say the deeper you get, uh, you may uh, add a certain, let's say, thickness for, um, for safety to avoid that uh, due to any kind of deviations you have, let's say, a too small wall uh, or in the ground. Yeah, I, I can understand. Uh... The basically the size of the cutter is mainly depends on the design, the what is the thickness of the wall you require, mm -hmm. and accordingly you choose your cutter widths. Yeah. yeah and cutter another, width, of uh, course, depend on, on soil conditions and rock conditions. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one more question from Steny Stephanie. Uh, the B-tronic uh, is used as a work monitoring system, allowing real-time corrective measures. The independent instrument such as CODEN should be seen as a systematic QQC checking instrument, generally not necessary to for every panel in a D-wall or diaphragm wall. Do you agree with that? Or often the engineer or the owner insists that CODEN to be used for all panels? This is a good question. And it's, it's a, let's say, ongoing discussion worldwide. Um, with, with the owners, of course, the owners uh, want to have the best quality control um, and want to have it independent. Um, it has to be said that the, it's the internal measurement is showing the location of the, of the tool, which means the cutter, but it's not showing the, let's say, the, the real shape of um, the excavated trench, whether there are some, some breakouts, uh, for instance, in, in granular soils. And uh, therefore, I would say for, for deep panels, um, I think it's most uh, appreciated if you do, let's say, this code and control. Um, if the panels are not that deep, I think uh, once in a while it's uh, not necessary to control all the panels. But this is really, I know. Uh, I, I do this discussion since since uh, almost thirty years. Correct. Of course, the owners actually always wants uh, best quality control measures, and uh, good contractors to be carried out diaphragm walls by adopting the good uh, best practices. Yeah. Uh, one question is from uh, Doctor Doctor Basarkar, and what? can be a good thumb rule to assess uh, progress rate of diaphragm wall, like in terms of meter per hour in rock. This is very essential requirement during tender estimates. Like say, you would like to ask, what is your rock cutting or maybe the rock depth of uh, the progress? Uh, this, is, this is something, of course, everybody wants to know. Um, of course, it depends on what condition. Of course, it depends. Um, on which kinds of wheels you're going to use. Um, we have in our brochure um, kind of a, let's say, table, or uh, it's more, it's more a small sketch where we uh, 
put all our experience we could, uh, let's say, receive from our customers into a kind of a, a band showing what kind of uh, performances could be achieved at various rock strengths. And this can be seen as a kind of a guide. But of course, there are a lot of other influencing factors as well. Uh, so, for instance, when you don't, let's say, look too much to your maintenance, uh, if you choose, let's say, the wrong tees, uh, maybe also some not, let's say, original tees, um, the operator has an influence. So there are a lot of other influencing factors as well. So, um, yes, I would suggest having a look to this brochure to get an idea. Um, but of course, these numbers uh, are just, let's say, showing experiences and cannot be guaranteed, but I'm pretty sure, um, let's say, 99% of these projects, uh, upcoming projects, will somehow fit into this uh, as well. Okay. So, uh, the question from Mr. Shivaraman. Uh, with the availability of range of cutters, how to choose the appropriate type of cutter to be used based on rock strength and other ground characteristics? Um, in principle, yeah, okay, it's based on experience. Of course, uh, when you don't have experience, uh, you need some, some support. And this is something uh, we usually uh, offer that uh, if a customer approaches us saying, okay, I have a specific project, these are my conditions, uh, and then we uh, take a look and can place some recommendations on using the right equipment, having the right setup, for instance, for the slurry handling, because this is something which is quite um, important as well, uh, to have the right setup for the slurry equipment, to have a good slurry in slurry. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, Mr. P Mr. Werner, just I would like to extend the same question, like uh, based on the rock strength, do you suggest like what type of teeth or roller bits to be used for trench cutter? I think that is the main uh, elements for trench cutter, right? The type What's of it? bullets or what type of bullets are in the trench cutter to be used based on the rock strength? Um, let's say we usually have these uh, round shaped chisels uh, out of our, let's say, catalog. There are various types and uh, Typically, we adjust it then on the job site, uh, whether we need a bit more aggressive ones or uh, less aggressive ones. In principle, you want to crack the rock and uh, not to mill the rock, so there might be always a little bit of, let's say, dry panels to find the right uh, set of properties. Okay. The question from Mr. Abhijit uh, Kanungo, maybe it's not relevant, but I would, I would like to read here. Is it possible to see precast T wall in feature for retaining soils, just like pre board uh, pre board precast pipe? Please confirm. Um, that, that means doing, uh, let's say, precast elements and and put them into trench and, uh, instead of concreting with a trimming concrete. Is this what is meant here? I think uh, he was asking like a precast a pre board precast piles. Yeah, it's like a, something like he was. He would like to ask that he want to trench it and after that keeping a precast panel inside. But that's not uh, maybe it's not very relevant uh, or maybe it's maybe difficult to do I'm that. Not sure whether I get this question in the right way, so I, I'm uh, not sure how to answer this question. So maybe um, yeah. you can approach me separately. Uh, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Abhijit, maybe you can write a separate email to. Yeah. Uh, Mr. French, uh, so that he can uh, he can confirm you, or maybe he can give you a broad view on that uh, aspect. But to give an answer, which doesn't yeah. fit the question. <laughs> Correct. You, you can just uh, send your question in more detailed manner, so that he can able to answer you better. And the next question from Mr. Amit Kumar: uh, Is there an is there is a video? If there is a video or animation is played while presentation. It will help better to understand the working process. I think it's more suggestion. It's not a it question. more comment. Um, yeah. It's, it's always the question what all fits <laughs> into it. But uh, I can, um, let's say, recommend to go on our YouTube channel. There you find some videos and animations um, for 
diaphragm wall or kind of walls, uh, which can help. Yeah. Uh, just due to the time limitations, uh, Mr. Franch, uh, maybe I would like to take only the last question here. Okay, so that the remaining questions maybe can be, uh, we can send it to you uh, over, over email. So you can you can respond to that, uh, the question, the responses to that. So the question from Mr. Alok uh, Homik, is it possible to construct D wall uh, in boundary strata? Uh, in principle, yes. But uh, again, it has to be um, considered uh, what are the consequences, what maybe needs to be prepared. Uh, I remember, for instance, one uh, big job site uh, carried out about, let's say, 15 years ago in, in Canada, where there were, let's say, a, a kind of gully full with boulders. And in this area, it was, let's say, only boulders without any fines. And uh, they need to, let's say, pre-inject first to give it a, let's say, a kind of a matrix uh, where these boulders were placed. Otherwise, trench stability would not be possible. But uh, after this, let's say, uh, preparation, then uh, it's possible to cut with more trench abilities. It's a certain amount of, let's say, Yeah, thanks, Mr. French. Uh, there are a few other questions, but uh, what we will do, we compile it and we will send it to you uh, in an email so that uh, you can respond to them uh, in, a, in, a, in a word format or other written format so that it can, it can helpful for others uh, while reading it. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. French, for your great presentation. You have given a very uh, overview of applications of diaphragm wall and different guidelines to be used in the slurry fluid concrete steel and even trench cut methods so it's a very uh, good presentation i would say as a, for beginners and as well as for the practitioners okay i would like to thank uh, a few uh, for uh, giving this session thank you mr french thank you yeah, i would like to thank all participants as well uh, uh, giving you, uh, giving, uh, asking very valuable questions uh, to the to the presenter. Okay, and uh, it's is it's it's not only useful for you; it's useful for each and every one, uh, and also participating very actively in this particular session. Thank you, all each and every uh, participants. Thank you, and uh, I will pass it to you, Ashrita. Yes, sir. Thank you, and we thank our session moderator, Mr. P. V. S. Prasad and our session uh, speaker, Mr. Franz Werner, for your uh, cooperation. Thank you so much. And a DSI Groundwork 2022 upcoming webinars is webinar five, which is on 17th May, 2022 on Tuesday from five to 6 p.m. IST. Title and speaker details will be shared soon. Thank you all for attending. See you in coming webinars. Thank you.